Run, river, run, run through the hills. Run, river, run to the sea. Run, river, run to your place beneath the sun. Run, river, run. Hi, welcome to Be My Guest. This is Jan Lewis, your host. Today we have Don Wilding, and Don is the an author, but he's also the executive director and co-founder of the Henry Beston Society. He also has a place on the Cape in Dennis, right? And he's right. over here. He lives not far from here in Northbridge. And he is the author of A Brief History of Eastham. Those are our Cape Cod fans out there, which I am too. He wrote this one. When did you write this one? Just last year. It came together pretty quickly. Well, no wonder I never saw it. <laughs> the Gateway to Cape Cod National Seashore. I learned how to surf. Oh, I was just a kid. I think at the National Seashore and the... Uh, Instructor came up to my parents. He says, I'll have her standing in an hour. They said, okay. They paid him. He had me standing. <laughs> but I didn't stay up for very long. No, that's that's some tough surfing. Out oh, there. it is. But it was fun. And then Henry Beston's Cape Cod. Now, many people have heard of Henry Beston. Who was he? Henry Beston was an author and writer from Quincy yeah. and wrote the book. He's best known for the book, The Outermost House. And The Outermost House was a... a Sort of, it's a nature classic, but it was also very influential on the establishment of the Cape Cod National Seashore. So uh, he he doesn't get as much attention as say Henry David Thoreau, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, it's some of the greatest prose that's ever been written about Cape Cod. Uh, if you want a book that will set you up for the natural settings of the Cape Cod National Seashore, the Outermost House is the one you want to look at. Now he lived there. Uh, yeah, very briefly. Yeah. Uh, he, he had a uh, he had a small house built out on the beach, what is now Coast Guard Beach, yeah. in East Ham, and he had he was only going to use it as a writing retreat. Uh, this was back in 1925. Right. He had it built there, and he had been in the war as a uh, member of the American Field Service, the ambulance service in France, and came back tra basically traumatized from all this. Yeah from what he saw in the war. And through all that, he stayed at this house and he stayed there more and more and more and then eventually wrote the book, The Outermost House, mm -hmm. which uh, became a classic it's, since it was published in 1925. I was just going to ask you because I think my grandparents might have had a copy in the cottage. They probably did. I've seen that. <laughs> it was actually published in 1928. He went there in 25. Okay to settle down and then he wrote the book uh, and it's never been out of print since. No, I've seen this, I think my mother may have had a copy too when I was growing up where she borrowed it from the library. For 85 years Henry Beston's The Outermost House has been the definitive book about Cape Cod and now our guest Don Wilding, the co-founder of the Henry Beston Society, tells the story behind Beston's timeless nature classic. All right. First, let's take let's tackle this. What's in this? Give us a, a hint. That's the kind of the behind the scenes of how Henry Beston came to write that book. Mm -hmm. uh, Beston doesn't tell you a lot about himself in the book. He's he's more focused on his surroundings. So this tells you how he gets there, how what he went through in the war, uh, why he went out to East Ham in the first place. He was actually documenting for a magazine article, uh, the experiences of the Coast Guardsmen of the Outer Cape uh, during that time when they were patrolling the beaches at night for ships in distress. So he, there was there's a lot of stories about that. And then what it came to mean, what the Outermost House came to mean for the Cape Cod National Seashore, because when they were starting to put together the whole game plan, mm -hmm. if you will, to established the seashore and that took a lot of maneuvering in Washington and such they they began to use the outermost house as a selling point yeah for the Cape Cod National Seashore so that's where we get the inspiration for a national seashore I love the call did you self publish this uh yes I love, it. I love it that's to me well people know it's my favorite way for people to go I I help authors out and uh, I love the way you've got this great picture of Don on the back and then it's right up on top Henry meditating on the dunes of Nasset. 
Who took this? I, wasn't he all alone? Who took this picture of him? It was probably a friend of his, actually. Did uh, he get he, married? Did he have a wife? He, he got married. He married the, the writer Elizabeth Coatsworth okay. in uh, 1929. And Elizabeth was a well-known children's writer and poet. Um, but at that point, I'm not sure who took that photo of him. Yeah. It was probably taken by uh, one of his Coast Guard friends or one of his other... He, he got to know a lot of people in East Ham. And the, and the house was destroyed in the bl that blizzard of 1978. Now, I was in Connecticut, and it hit all the way up there, too. Yeah, it was actually uh, in Massachusetts is where the blizzard of 78 was at its worst. Yeah. Because what happened was that storm stalled off the coast, yeah. and it just kept sending one band of snow after another. So if you were in this area, you were getting buried. Yeah. If you were out on the Cape, it was, it. It was not so much snow you were getting pounded with high winds and and heavy rain and worst off was it was the was the uh, high tides which took it which took out his house so it was the tides that really it took came, it out he was too close to the edge there yeah i mean and he is he was he had been dead for 10 years by the time that happened yeah, he, was, he was dead he, was, he died in 1968 what happened he was awfully young wasn't he no he was almost 80 years old uh, well, but at yeah, that point okay. but uh he was he he had been in ill health for some time and his house had been there all that time. It managed. They had to move it twice over the years, and eventually it it, it hung on. But it, that storm was just too much. Did they build anything on that land years later for people to tour? Like a, they haven't. Uh, and and that's one of the things with the Henry Beston Society that we would like to do. But that's a huge project, mm -hmm. and it's uh, that entire beach actually was leveled and pushed backward and it's much smaller now wow. than it was back in 1978 when did you found co-found the uh, the henry beston society that would is that was in 2002 so it's not that old you know it's really only 16 years old now. right what made you decide to do that well we just thought that my wife nita and i both uh were big fans of the book and i had just dove into all things at our most house uh, i'm I'm a long-time newspaper man, yeah. so jack-of-all-trades in, in that business, and so naturally I tend to research things, yeah. and that's one book I just couldn't put down, yeah. and one thing led to another, basically. And that was it. Mm, yeah. And so you found it, in the, how, did you find, is it based on the Cape, or is it out here more towards this area? No, it's more based on the Cape. It's on the Cape. Yeah, we actually have an, a small office out in uh, East Ham as well. So it's not a group that meets once a month? No, no, we're very informal, we're very small. Uh, we mostly uh, have gotten involved with um, doing these lecture presentations. Yeah. The, the Henry Beston one I've probably done about 150 times. But do you come over across the bridge <coughs> about this way? Oh, sure. Where yeah. have you been? Where have you now, been? I've been around, just around here, uh, in this area, I've been at Milford a couple of times. I missed you then, okay. Uh, I've... Uh, and not only doing the best in talk for the best in society, but I also do my own things on shipwrecks and. Uh, you do shipwrecks too. Sure, absolutely. Do you have any books about it? Uh, well, the, we do. Okay, I yeah. do go into it a little bit in the book about Easton. A brief history of Easton on the outer beach of Cape Cod. Before we go to Florida, we're talking with John Wilding, and he is the co-founder and executive director of the Henry Beston Society, based on the Cape. And then, of course, he's the author of the one we just showed you, Henry Beston's Cape Cod. And then now, a brief history of Eastham on the outer beach of Cape Cod. Now, tell me about this one. This one is a kind of a, if, if you talk to 10 different historians, they would give you 10 different viewpoints of, of East Ham, of the history of it, yeah. because there's, it's a very extensive history. Yeah. Uh, it's one of the earliest towns that was established on the Cape after the first few in uh, Barnstable and Sandwich and such. but. It was originally known as Nauset, mm -hmm. and that was, East Ham was the location of the first encounter between the, the pilgrims and the Nauset Indians, and there were a lot, there's a lot of other history there too, mm -hmm. if, whether you're talking about Beston, whether you're talking about the Coast Guard, the shipwrecks, rum runners, there's been, uh, you know, you look at all the things, but the, there was also a lot of agriculture in East Ham See, I didn't know for that. a long yeah, time. Yeah. Corn was big, and especially asparagus or speargrass, as they called it back then, and back in the early 1900s. 
Uh, but turnips are what East Ham is probably best known for, the famous East Ham turnip. It's much sweeter and much much easier to deal <laughs> with, I think, that's for a lot of people. Do they have the cranberry? Right? I know when we lived in South Yarmouth, the cranberry bogs were everywhere around there. It was, it was mm. strictly a third place yeah. type of crop. In East Ham. Don, quick before we forget, how do people get a hold of your books? Get a hold and get a hold of you too, and have you do presentations? Uh, well, through my website is actually a good place. Okay. Uh, dwcapecod.com. Oh, that's easy. Yes. Dwcapecod. Dwcapecod.com, and yes, you can book me through the website uh, for talks. Uh, also through henrybeston.org uh, for the Beston programs. Mm -hmm. uh, we also do that. So. That's the best way, but I have been around here in many places, um, Milford, Milford yeah. Northborough, Milford. Southborough, uh, a variety of other places, uh, Holliston, I've been over there. Okay. Uh, so the programs I've done have been around have here. Have you been to Tatnock? I have not. Oh, right over, eight minutes away. Oh, okay. Westboro. Huge. Oh, in Westboro. Very okay. popular bookstore. Oh, yes. Very, okay, I'm familiar with it. Definitely. Uh, but I've also been uh, mostly, the programs are mostly done on the Cape mm. for the most part. Yeah. Now, you've, did you live on the Cape before you decided to move out to Northbridge, or how did this happen? Oh, yeah. I'd been uh, I'd been out in Dennis from, geez, it was a, it was a good eight years okay, so that I'd been there. So when I lived out there, you hadn't gotten there yet. I was there in the, my 70s. I was a kid. I was in, my in the 70s with my parents. Yeah, I wasn't there until 2003. So. Okay, so all right. Things, but in the changes that Don has shared with me. I mean, the Coliseum isn't there anymore. No, long gone. I mean, all the cranberry bogs still have to be there. Yeah, right? they're still around. I remember that. And we were talking about as you go through Dennisport, then there was that great fried clam place called the Wee Packet. Oh, the, the wee, wee packet. packet. Oh, yep. my father, that was a treat. He would take us there, <clears throat> and the owner was this big guy and funny and all this type of thing. But it's Don's books. He brings back memories of the Cape. Um, when did, did did this take, how long did it take you to read this one? It just came out, right? The yeah, one? it just came out uh, last July, actually. How long did you work on that? And I began working on it. I already had accumulated a lot of material yeah. for it. Uh, but I still had a lot of research and writing to do yeah. afterwards. And I began it in really heavily in October of 2016, and I was done with it. I had to have it, everything done by February 1st. Wait, and, somebody gave you a date? Oh, that, that was for the History Press, yes. Oh, okay. And oh, that, uh, so I had to get that together very, very quickly. Talk about stress. Yeah, well, <laughs> 30 years in newspapers teaches you something do you, about that. Do you write, Don, when you're up in, uh, in the Cape, or do you write in Northbridge, or both? Both. You both. Is it yeah. more peaceful either way? Or? It varies. Yeah. You, you never know what from day to day. Yeah. Um, I, I probably wrote most of this in Northbridge. Really? Although a lot of the research was done on the Cape. A Brief History of Eastham. The Gateway to Cape Cod National Seashore. Now, Nosset Beach is in Eastham, right? Well, it depends. The entire area has been pretty much had the Nosset label on it. Mm. But Nosset, you've got two beaches with Nosset names. You've got Nosset Light in North Eastham, and you've got Nosset Beach in Orleans, mm -hmm. and also extends down somewhat into Chatham, okay. which they, uh, you know, people kind of throw the term around loosely. Um, mm -hmm. But those are the two areas, really, where the name Nosset is on the beach. The name Nosset was actually given to the entire territory in 1644 when <laughs> some uh, English settlers who were not happy with their way of life in the Plymouth Colony mm -hmm. decided to return to the Outer Cape. They'd had their first encounter back in 1620, mm -hmm. and they came back to settle out in East Ham and made an arrangement with the natives. Yeah. And the Nosset Indian tribe. And that, that area actually extended from Provincetown all the way almost to Dennis. So it was a variety of different territories yeah. uh, that eventually were villages and then they became the towns and eventually broke away the last one being Orleans in 1797. Well, now, Dennisport, where my family's cottage was, did that break away from Dennis proper? 
Or no, that's actually part of Dennis. Okay, they were all part of each other. Yeah. Uh, fact, West Dennis, Dennis, Dennis. Well, West Dennis was actually one time part of Yarmouth, what? believe it or not. Really? Yes. So they, uh, there's, there's kind of a loose history with some of these communities. And yeah. uh, when you look at Dennis itself, the town of Dennis has Dennis Port, yeah. West Dennis, South Dennis, Dennis, and East Dennis. Now, Dennis Port so. is the most... Oh, most more, more like a little town city type of thing. It's more active, right? Isn't it more? There's a lot more going on in Dennisport than I remember. I'd say they're all. I'd say they're all pretty even now. South Dennis is very. Uh, all right. Because in the seventies, it seemed like Dennisport with the center there, where my father had his printing shop. That seemed to be the the hub. It was. But, but now it's changed. Right? Yeah, they had all like the the supermarkets were down there yeah. and everything, and then they moved. Uh, they opened Patriot Square up near Route Six. Uh, in, on 134. So mm -hmm. now that area has become very dominant in terms of commerce and things like that. Well, we're talking with Don Wilding, and again, he is the uh, co founder and executive director of the Henry Beston Society. If you've read Henry Beston's book, The uh, the Outermost House, true story, and the house went kaput in 1978 when we had that huge storm. I was in Connecticut. It was bad enough there. I can imagine what it would be at his house. And he also is the author of both of these books, A Brief History of Eastham and then Henry Beston's Cape Cod. Uh, what was I going to say to you? When are you going to be appearing next? Or anywhere around here? Well, uh, the closest thing, I was just at the Milford Library a couple of weeks ago. And I missed you. I and missed it. it's uh, around here, the closest one will be in East Providence. Right. on June 18th. Yeah. Uh, most of what I'll be doing over the next several months though will be on Cape Cod. Okay. Uh, whether it's uh, leading a, I'll be leading a walk for the Harwich Conservation Trust uh, at the Cape Cod National Seashore about the outermost house. That's yeah. on June 16th. Will you actually go right up to where the house was? Near no, you can't do that anymore it's because it's, it's, uh, that's underwater. That, that location. That's so sad. You know, I'm really, the guy spent how many years living there? How? He was only there for a few years really. But uh, yeah. and he molded it into a year of life on the outer beaches. Was it like one it. bedroom house, like a little? Tiny yeah, thing? that's all it was. It was two rooms. <coughs> he and his wife bed. lived in just two. It rooms. was only him. It was before he got married. Before he got married, just two rooms. Yeah, just two rooms. How did he, he earn money? Was it? He was. He was pretty. I think his his family provided for him pretty well prior. It was only him and his brother at that point. You think the the World War the left. war really affected him? Huh? In a big way. Psychiatrically. And yes, he was uh, pretty traumatized from the whole thing. But he wrote an excellent book. Yeah, it was kind of his healing process, really. When he got out there and he started experiencing all the, uh, what the Outer Beach had to offer, it's, and nature will teach you a lot of things. Yeah. Uh, it will teach you to, it teaches you about the law of averages and, uh, one day it can be absolutely drop dead gorgeous outside, mm -hmm. and then the next day you're getting pounded with the worst possible storm. Uh, you walk the beach and you're getting sand in your face from the wind. I remember. Yes, it's it's it can be tough. But he died ten ten years before this, it, this <coughs> house before the destroyed. storm. Yeah, I'm glad he never saw that. Yeah, he in you know his wife had s said this is the way he would have wanted it to go. I think really? he knew. I think he knew that because when he had the house built, his carpenter. Uh, told him that you know float away one day you know and he didn't care at didn't that point care. and it almost it was built in 1925 he almost lost it in 1933 well, it, it, it almost there was a storm came in yeah. the storm uh, washed away 20 feet of sand in front of the uh, in front of his house in front of his house and it was almost on the edge and they had to have it lifted and moved back so if that was in 1933. And then he so had to have it done again in 1944. Because something else happened. Right? Another storm. Yeah, was, this constant erosion. And then like by 30 something years later, finally it went under. And then finally, he actually had it moved up off the dune and then down closer to Nauset Marsh and it would flood in. Yeah. But during the 78 storm, the, the tides were so high, they were four feet above normal. Yeah. And it just destroyed the entire beach. It overran it. And pushed it back. I so who found it, or who, did anybody actually see this happening? Oh, people saw it. Yeah, oh. yeah. A lot of people were standing there watching it happen. In fact, there were crowds of people standing around on the beach because what happened was the eye of the storm. It actually developed an eye, and it passed over East Ham. So the sun was out during this storm. Is this the side storm of seventy-eight? Same seventy-eight storm. The big storm. Okay. While it's, you could see to the west all this dark sky, 
that was pounding Boston and the South yeah, Shore Connecticut. and mm-hmm. everything. And just and you were sitting, you were in the eye. The sun was out, and people were standing at the beach watching the Coast Guard Beach bathhouse was getting pounded. They had to destroy that, yeah. and a lot of these cottages, and just Beston's house, but several others, were, were, were swept away by the by the incoming tide, and people were were just watching this. And I remember I did an interview uh, with Robert Finch, one of the he's sort of the Henry Beston of today, yeah. and he was there, and he said I just couldn't believe it. He said we, we were we were watching this waves coming in and smashing this bathhouse to pieces and he said with every wave the crowds would just cheer Why? watching it and that's what he said what what Why? are they cheering about the awesome power of nature is what they were cheering well but i wouldn't be cheering, watching show. henry beston's uh, house going down no people were sad about that no yeah, question definitely. but by that time it the house had been swept into the marsh and pieces of it were washing ashore so th- that was going on out in the marsh, sure. and then, but on, right on the beach, watching that bathhouse get pounded, mm-hmm. there were they, they drew thousands of people there that day. Don, how long have you been interested? This is fascinating to me. All into Henry Beston's life like that. Uh, it goes back about twenty over twenty years now. So I'd when say. you were a kid, were you really big into Cape Cod? Not really. I didn't this just know hit you much. Later, yeah, yeah I, I started to go out there a lot. Uh, during the 1990s, I was in my th- mid-30s at mm-hmm. that point, and it was one of those discoveries you make, I guess, along the way, and I thought to myself, this place is great. I always liked it, but I never got to spend much time there, no. and now I've spent extensive amounts of time So there. you're Dennis. You have your other home in Dennis. Right. Okay, and then you're out here in Northbridge. Dennis is not, you're not far from where the Dennis Port Cottage was that we were in. No, not at all. That's that's 10 minutes away. Uh, and, I, and I know that area that you're speaking of. Old Wharf Road. Yep. Long Island, and what was the other road you said? Oh, uh, Lower County. Lower County. I remember that. Sure. Now, what, dare I ask if you have another one coming up? Well, uh, there's a lot of things I'm throwing around at this point. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm, I've done a lot of work recently researching the rum runners of Cape Cod. Now what was that? Did they come from like another country and thought they could sell their booze here to us? Well they did. They did they, quite they well. They came across the It Atlantic? was big business during the era of Prohibition between 1920 and 1933. Mm-hmm. They actually set would set up foreign ships uh, from Bermuda, from Europe, uh, and mostly from the islands of St. Pierre and Miquelon off of Newfoundland. Yeah. These are French possessions. So they would come out our way. And the, they would they would load the ships up. They would call them mother ships. They would load up these ships. They would sit offshore just outside of jurisdiction. Where, like, uh, off, let's say, from if we're trying to picture the coast of Cape Cod, what town would they be more off of? Dennisport? Eastham? More more off the outer Cape, probably. Like there Provincetown? Were, yeah, okay. they would just they would have to be a good 12 miles or so. So they couldn't be. Then uh, how did they get it in and sneak it in at night? Well, what they would do is at night, they would sit, people would from the Cape, and a lot of these were freelance types. Some of them worked <laughs> with crime syndicates. Yeah. But they, some of them just did it on their own. They would have these speedboats, and they would go out under cover of darkness to these ships, and they would do a transaction with these... They had speedboats back then? Sure. They would actually, a lot of them would use um, Liberty Motors, they called them, yeah. uh, which were pretty powerful engines. They actually came off of uh, World War I airplanes. And they would use these on the boats, and that would enable them to outrun the Coast Guard during that procedure. So they could go out there, get the booze, bring it back. They would do it undercover, and usually on the night of a new moon, you know, when yeah. not with a full moon, because no. you wanted as much darkness as possible. It would get unloaded on a beach, and then taken, maybe they'd have a warehouse locally. There was one down at Rock Harbor in Orleans. Mm-hmm. Uh, where they would unload, and then they would take everything off Cape, and it would get sold to Boston and Providence or wherever. Uh, there were they would bring trucks out there that would load up. They were posing as uh, produce buyers sometimes. Yeah, yeah. They would load up with carrots on the outside, wow. and then they would put the booze in the middle, and then <laughs> the trucks would go off Cape, and they'd have a couple of other cars accompanying them. Yeah. One car would have guys with machine guns. 
and another car to avoid hijackings because there would be hijackings of these vehicles sometimes. Yeah. Also on the open water, they had to worry about that. Mm -hmm. And then they would go uh, also have another car with a guy that had a big wad of cash. And that would be to pay off any law enforcement infrastructure. You're, you're full of the, we're talking with Don Juan. <laughs> Don, before we close, you quickly, you mentioned something about shipwrecks. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. you think your next book might be about shipwrecks? Well, I, I might touch on that too. I, I'm not completely, I'm still mapping the whole thing so out. Maybe so maybe in a year or so you might have a new book out, right? I mean, it's possible. All right, it's now, possible. are you going to, are these going to be downstairs on the dedicated author's wall? Yeah, I can Very good. Down. So, yep. here you go. Kate, Henry Beston's Cape Cod, the outer, from How the Outermost House Inspired a National Seashore by Don Wilding, and his brief history of Eastham on the outer beach of Cape Cod, again by Don Wilding. You can each find a copy downstairs in the Upton Town Library. Um, also, how do they get a hold of this online? Online, you can go to uh, dwcapecod.com uh, and also at henrybeston.org for anything related to uh, the Henry Beston book or the uh, Henry Beston Society. How would they book you to do a presentation? Uh, either way, but it's probably best through dwcapecod.com. dwcapecod.com. Yeah. How far will you travel, John? Uh, I tend to keep it uh, in eastern Massachusetts. Okay. Uh, it depends. You might come out. The, well, you've been out this way. It was in Milford. Sure. Sure. You might go. I've been out as far west as Westfield, actually. Oh, that's near where I grew up. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. it's I and I've that. gone. I have gone up to New Hampshire oh. and Maine on occasion. What I, town in Maine? Uh, it was in Demerscotta, be and also in Nobleboro, because Nobleboro is where Henry Beston moved after he got married. And he lived oh, up he there for away, many years. He? Yes, he did. Where in New Hampshire were you? Did you go? Uh, it was in Hopkinton, New Hampshire. Is that, it's not near Plymouth, is it? No, no it's 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 about half. It's, well, I wouldn't say halfway up, but it's a, it was a pretty good ride, I remember. And <laughs> it was, uh, it's, yeah, it took forever. And, and oddly enough, the woman who organized it, my talk up there many years ago, I came back down here just recently to do a program for the Orleans Historical Society mm -hmm. and it turned out that the woman who was the director down at the Orleans Historical Society that was her mother who booked me many years ago so yeah, it's this a small is, world. Well keep these books coming will you? No, I'm because this is, I know that I, I'm pretty <laughs> sure I saw I can picture Henry Beston's book on some shelf was it in the cottage my grandparents owned or had my mother borrowed it, or both, from a library? It's possible. That I may have even looked possible, at it, too, yeah. and read some years ago. Sure. But it's on many a bookshelf in Cape Cod cottages, that's for sure. I remember the smell of the Cape Cod cottage. Oh, I don't know what it is. The um, Well, it was an old cottage, but it was just a wonderful smell. You knew you were at the beach. Mm. We could hear the ocean from it, you know, and... Uh, I, Wish I could afford to get one again, but nowadays you probably couldn't afford the front door. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty uh, pricey, and I look at some of the prices of uh, people were buying like the old Three Sisters lighthouses oh. when they were put up for auction, and yeah. people were paying fifty bucks for them. Yeah, if that, you know, it was it's yeah. pretty crazy. All right, well, be sure to let us know when the next one comes out. Okay. Sure thing. All right, we'll see you next time. I'd be my guest. <laughs>